Good evening, everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome uh, to uh, the Irish Wildlife Trust webinar series. Uh, for an, another year, I think this is our third year now starting off. We started it during the pandemic um, when we felt everything was shut down and um, such has been the popularity that um, I think we, we're going to keep going with, uh, with these webinars. Um, so it's wonderful to start another season after, uh, after the break for the summer. I hope you all had a, a restful break uh, and got outdoors and, uh, and got some sunshine and nice contact with nature over the summer months. And uh, delighted to see so many of you back uh, for this webinar series with the autumn and the, the closing evenings and uh, and it's a nice time of year to uh, to start getting stuck into these kinds of things again. Uh, just to remind you, uh, I am Porrick. I work for the Irish Wildlife Trust. Uh, the Irish Wildlife Trust is a non-governmental charitable organisation that has been around since the late 1970s. And uh, we rely on what we do uh, uh, for our, our members. Uh, so if you do want to support our work, please do go on to iwt.ie and consider joining and becoming a member and, uh, and helping us with the work that we do. We try to keep all these events uh, uh, free so that they can be as accessible to as many people as possible and we want to keep it that way but we do also uh, need the support as well. I'll also add that um, if you are curious about the previous webinars that we've held over the past two years, please do go on to our YouTube channel uh, where uh, you can watch back any of them. And we've covered a great range of topics over the last couple of years, uh, and I'm sure some of them will be of interest to you. But it's a, it's a wonderful resource to have. Um, so great. So I think that's all from me. And uh, like I say, I've been uh, absolutely astonished at the number of people who um, signed up to this webinar. So it's great to see such interest uh, and of course we're going to talk about uh, mushrooms and fungi which have got great public attention I think in recent years with uh, various books and um, series on Netflix and so on uh, and it's wonderful to see such such interest in these this fascinating group of organisms and with that, I'm very uh, happy to welcome uh, Maria Cullen. And uh, Maria, I think is, it's fair to say, is one of Ireland's foremost mycologists. So a mycologist is uh, someone who studies uh, mushrooms and fungi. In fact, Maria calls herself a, a geomycologist. So we might get an explanation as to, as to what that is. And uh, uh, Maria, of course, has studied uh, not only mushrooms, but lichens and um, and uh, edible fungi in Ireland, as well as the effects of air pollution on lichen recruitment on trees. And Maria is the director of Woodlands of Ireland and of the Organic Centre in Ross Inver. And she is the current chairperson of the Society of Pan Plant Pathologists. And I know, um, I remember going to uh, one of your mushroom uh, forays possibly over 10 years ago, Maria, we were in um, the Charleville Estate in, in County Offaly. And what a wonderful event that was. And uh, not only the uh, your great enthusiasm and knowledge, but uh, I remember you giving me a beefsteak fungus to sample uh, after, uh, after all the work. So it really is a fantastic uh, event if anybody ever gets a chance to do a, a fungal foray. Anyway, Maria, I'm so delighted you could uh, make it uh, this evening. And uh, in your own time, please, um, you can share your screen and over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Farouk. Um, now. Hmm. Is that coming up for you? It is. Yay. Yeah, perfect. It's a bit Love slow. It. Yeah. Okay, great stuff. Um, well, thank you for that huge introduction and Thanks everybody for coming along this evening to listen. Uh, I hope there's something in it for everybody. I'm trying to keep it broad. It's a huge subject and there's only so much you can do in an hour, but uh, we'll try to uh, do something for everybody there. Okay, so mushrooms and other fungi in Ireland. First off, I just want to introduce what a fungus is and it's extremely complicated. Uh, there are both lichenized and non-lichenized fungi. So the lichens are fungus and algae or fungus and cyanobacterium. And the ascomyces then take up uh, the rest of the um, fungi apart from the lichens. So most lichens are in the ascomycetes. There are basidiomycetes. These are the cap and stem mushrooms and bracket fungi. 
And then we get into smaller groups of fungi that we probably won't spend very much time on at all. Um, the chytridia mycota, which were uh, the oomycetes in the past, kind of, and they include the freshwater moles. Um, and then zygomycetes have been split in recent times. And the slime moles or my mixed mycetes are outside of the fungi altogether now. Uh, there has been a huge change in the way we look at fungi. Um, and this is a bit of an example of how we've now split the different groups of fungi. Um, so the basidiomycota and the ascomycota are the main ones, as I said. Down below at the bottom of this slide are the animals, including us. And so we're fairly closely related to the fungi after all. This revolution in mycological taxonomy has been happening for at least the last 20 years. Um, we started off in the beginning with optical features, things we can see in the field. And then with microscopic features, um, the use of microscopes and thin layer chromatography, uh, people started looking at the chemistry of different species as well. But in recent times, genetics and bioinformatics have taken over and Sanger sequencing of the shorter regions has developed on into full genomic data analysis. Uh, so this has kind of, uh, been the focus of assembling the fungal tree of life. And that project has been really, really uh, moving on in the last few years, um, nearly finished now. But this whole, whole idea that there are so many fungi in the world that we're barcoding them rather than giving them names. And names are kept really for the species that we know and love and see uh, in hand sample. So if you're thinking about becoming a mycologist, it's an excellent time to start because so many names have changed in recent years and I'm finding it hard to remember the new names. Uh, I think we can date people by the time they uh, start in mycology from the names they are more comfortable with. Uh, if you're seeing this slide, uh, it's a bit scary and this is why it's complicated. The fungal tree of life map as of 2021 looks a bit like this. And as you can see, it's dominated by the ascomycetes and basidiomycetes. So unless you're very, very interested in water fungi or something else in the minor groups, uh, we'll stick with these. And there's this beautiful rendition of the fungi that we have in the world today, a uh, huge, a range of colors and shapes and sizes of fungi. It's a really beautiful kingdom. And uh, it's a privilege to look at these species at all. So the main characteristics of the kingdom fungus, or kingdom fungi, um, they are spore producers as opposed to pollen producers. They're non-vascular. So they're still considered in the plant world uh, in the world of botany, but they are non-vascular. They are unicellular or filamentous in nature. Obviously, they lack chlorophyll and they are eukaryotic. Their cells contain membrane-bound nucleus and other organelles. And one of the distinctive features of fungi is that they have chitinous cell walls, which means that fungi are very tough. They are found in nuclear reactor cores. There was a wonderful paper in 2007 that discussed this. Uh, they are found on whiskey and brandy bond houses. These are warehouses for cognac and whiskey maturation. And uh, there's a species that lives and takes the angel share, as it's called. So, Baudonia compnia canensis. I never can pronounce that one. And, uh, Recently, there have been experiments involving space and the International Space Station. There was a life project that put uh, Xanthori elegans and some other lichen species out, uh, outside the International Space Station in these nice little trays for over a year and a half. 
And then they brought back the species and poured water on them when they got them back to Earth. And they grew as if nothing much had happened to them. So these fungi, or like a nice fungi in this case, um, use dormancy as a survival tactic that is extremely useful and important. The other thing about fungi is that they get around. They have many ways to spread by spores, fragments of themselves, canidia, acidia, and ceridia. So they're extremely good at survival and in spreading. <clears throat> The geological history of fungi is complicated too. And um, <clears throat> as you can see here, there are uh, different types of fossils going back a very long time. I suppose the biggest issue for fungi in the geologic record and in on other planets, um, life on other planets in general, is that we don't always know what we're looking for. In fact, we don't know what we're looking for at all in the beginning. So <clears throat> these Congolese fossils are considered to be um, real fungi, and they date from around 800 million years ago. I'm not sure exactly when. They're from the Congo, but they were in uh, shelves on uh, a museum in Belgium before they were discovered and described by Steve Bonneville's group. Um, in the Devonian period, about 400 million years ago, there was a forest potentially of huge uh, fungi, eight metres tall, these prototaxites, which uh, had been mysterious as to their origin and nature until they were really analyzed in 2007. There were reports of what they were. And then um, Christine Struli Darian did some really nice work on the Rhiney Church, which is silicious fossils in the south of Scotland. And uh, she's come up with some interesting results and species there as well. There are maybe lichenized fungi. The debate on lichenization and when it might have happened um, is still raging somewhere in academia. So Ireland, as a geologist, I always think back to geology and the context for species and where things are and why they are, where they are, what they like. So when we look simply at the geology of Ireland, we're dealing with a saucer-shaped island. Um, there are green schist fasces and Caledonian granites from 400 plus million years ago. Then we have the Devonian sandstones of the southwest of Ireland, the old red sandstones. Um, in the northeast of Ireland and the island, we have tertiary basalts of uh, about 70 million years. And then we have much older material as well in the Cambrian meta sediments in the northwest um, of Ireland. Uh, there are various other little blocks of things. And then we have mainly in the dish of the saucer, we have the limestones across the basin of Ireland, the Carboniferous limestones. Um, on top of everything, we have significant quaternary glacial deposits too, and soil formation then on top of that. So when we look at the climate, we're obviously in an Atlantic temperate climate, and this climate favors fungi. So it's not an extreme environment, and there's possibilities for such a wide range of fungi here. We also have quite a high rainfall in the west of Ireland, although the east of Ireland is drying out somewhat. The west enjoys or not enjoys a metre and a half of rain up to that. And that puts us in a very uh, positive environment for extreme Atlantic species or rainforest species of an Atlantic nature. So that is the Lobarian community on trees where we have trees on the west coast of Ireland and in the highest rainfall areas. In terms of botany, then, I suppose you're all very familiar with the general botany, um, the land area of Ireland, the uh, Republic of Ireland is 70,000 kilometers square, so it's not a tiny island. And um, of this 7% of our land cover is exotic forest cover. So that includes Picea sicensis, Sosica, and Pinus contorta. Um, we have less than 
3% native forest cover, so woodland cover, and that was down to less than 1% uh, at the turn of the century, the 1900 century. And that uh, means that much of our native woodland that has potential for holding ectomycorrhizal fungi, I'll come to what they are in a minute, but basically they are teaming up with trees to live. Uh, those fungi and the epiphytic flora, so the flora that lives on twigs and barks of trees, they were much reduced from what they might be. And it's quite hard for them to recover in some cases. Excellent host trees for fungi, well, we're blessed in that oak, hazel, uh, these are not all native, but uh, Quercus elex, Castania, Fagus sylvatica, so beech. Beech is considered a non-native tree, and it was introduced in the 17th century onwards um, and widely planted. So where fungi live? Well, they nearly live everywhere on Earth. Uh, they enjoy uh, such a wide range of habitats on rock, soil, water, on plants and in plants and trees. Um, they live in us, they live on us and other animals as well and insects. So some of the habitats that I really like to look at are native woodlands. And you can see here a really nice oak um, in Glenarm Forest. Uh, this has a couple of very obvious species. I suppose when we think we're looking at bark color, we're actually looking at lichen color. Um, in, in this case, the white here is a lichen patna. Wet woodlands, I cannot emphasize enough how important wet woods are for epiphytic lichen species in Ireland. And our hedgerows. So uh, to the left hand side of this picture, uh, there is a cut hedge, which is much poorer in the potential for epiphytic species than this lush, beautiful right hand side of the image. And then bog and heath, it's fantastic for cladonia species of lichens. Um, bog beacons as well are fungi in bog pools, and they're really stunning to look at. The wood of heath supports quite a wide range of fungi as well. Of course, uh, we are a mycobiome, among other things, ourselves. I don't want to focus on this. It's not my area of expertise either, but it is quite terrifying sometimes when we go to international conferences. Some of the talks will be on uh, terrible fungi about to descend on humanity and destroy us. Uh, Candida is one mentioned here, and Candida auris is spreading around the world. Um, mainly in airports to hospitals. It's a terrifying one because it can kill people within a few days of them becoming infected. So not all of the fungi that we deal with, like uh, penicillium is quite good for a lot of people unless you're allergic to it, of course, but um, a lot of very, very challenging fungi for the human microbiome. So when do fungi happen? I suppose when it comes to lichens, uh, there's no seasonality that is very strictly held. Uh, the lichens can be, look actually more successful and they're more obvious when the leaves fall from the trees and they're damp and cool and active. So they are very vibrant in color and they're much more visible. But for fungi, we have a small spring flush in April and May. Um, generally speaking, it's all about the air water balance in the soil. As interstices in the soil become more aerated or less aerated through the seasons. So in the spring, uh, the air in the soil becomes more uh, 
more of it and the water levels go down uh, ideally anyway and that brings on a spring flush that features things like um, the St. George's mushroom but our spring flush isn't so huge compared to continental spring fungi flushes. In the autumn time is really our time for fungi in Ireland that is the non-lichenized fungi and the autumn flush can go from June really to November or when the really hard frosts come uh, to, to bear. And then the air water balance is reversing for the winter months as water fills those air pockets in the soil. So fungi have different functions in our experience of them. They are commensal to symbiotic, uh, the lichens being a very strict symbiosis of um, algae and fungi or cyanobacteria and fungi, and with yeasts now uh, in the mix as well. But we also have saprobic fungi. They are the breakdown fungi. They take uh, lignin and cellulose and break them down in our wider environment. Then there are parasitic fungi. Um, we're looking at uh, cauliflower fungus here, and it uh, is mildly parasitic on pine. Then we come to stronger parasites to pathogenic fungi. We're looking in the bottom right hand corner at the bootstraps of our malaria melia, and it can climb along under the bark of a tree, climb up through the root systems and kill the tree and control a whole area of woodland. So when we're looking at the general anatomy of a toadstool in this case, or mushrooms, then um, we also want to have a look at some of the features, some of the things that we use to describe the different parts of the fungus. So we have the cap color, obviously, the shape of the cap and its texture. And these change over time. So as soon as you pick a mushroom, you know yourself, it starts deteriorating, it can dry out and change color quite radically. So it's always good if you are getting serious about it to describe the fungi um, from the time that you see it in the field. And then if you dry it down, describe it again. The spore bearing surfaces can be gills in the case of these Amanita species, but in others it's pores or spines. So pores would be mainly the bolete family which takes in Lexinum and Swillis in the old days anyway. And then the spiny uh, spore bearing surfaces are features of the hedgehog mushroom or hidden. Then what the spore color is, is very helpful. Um, and the ring, whether it's present around the stem or stipe technically of the fungus. Um, if there's a ring, what shape is the ring and the texture of it? Smell is very important, and if it's edible, taste, of course. But the stipe itself, again, shape and color, the flesh inside, what shape, what color, actually, what color change does it go through? Does it have a smell? Does it produce milk? And then uh, the base, very, very important for telling the Amanita group from others, whether there's a vulva, a flap of skin at the base, which gives the Amanitas generally uh, their description. So if you're learning how to pick fungi for the pot, always pick the base in the beginning, and then you can tell whether you have all the parts to tell you if you have an Amanita or not. Very important to avoid them. Okay, and then mycelia. Mycelial connections will spring forth from the base of a fungus. Uh, some people like to cut the fungus above the ground. It keeps the fungi clean, and it also means that you're not doing more damage than you need to to the fungus if you're picking it. But the mycelial connections through the soil connect the fungus to a tree or to the leaf litter that it's consuming. And of course, the interconnectedness of 
all of these species together is really, really important in signaling across what's going on and what stressors might be um, in the mix. Okay. So you all know fungi already. Some of you know more than I do. Some of you don't know too many yet, but they are really beautiful and very noticeable and very photogenic as well. Um, lots of people would have met most of these or all of these species at some point. So we'll come to them. You've seen the Amanita muscaria there, the fly agaric. This is a very huge example of a giant puffball. And the record, there is a Guinness Book of Records for edible species of mushrooms, believe it or not. And this uh, pair of guys have found a 23.68 kilogram giant, giant puffball. The Giral or golden chanterelle, the Cantharella sabarius, it's uh, quite a small mushroom. It can be confused with the false chanterelle. So that's the only thing to watch out for there. But they're a beautiful mushroom, very delicate flavor, very um, revered in Spain in particular, where they're called uh, Revelones or Nescalos. Tree lungwort is a lichen. It's a cyanobacterial western uh, fungus associate. It's an old or ancient woodland indicator species, and it finds it hard to move around from host to host. So even though it fragments and produces fruit, and out of those fruits come spores, it still finds it very hard, even where there is regrowth after clear felling or fire, for the tree lungwort to find the same host again and to grow on a similar tree. So it's easily cut out of a woodland, which is it's quite restricted now in Ireland. And the I mentioned the drying out of the eastern half of Ireland. The localities in the east of Ireland where Loberia pulmonaria was found previously are under severe stress or uh, have lost Loberia pulmonaria in recent times. Uh, summer truffle or tuberae stevum. We've got six or seven edible uh, species of truffles in Ireland that have been recorded. There are other hypogaeus fungi that are not edible and the Rias of Pogon and other groups, but uh, this is quite widespread in Ireland. It's hard to get information on the truffle. It's also known as the burgundy truffle, but uh, the people who know about it don't tend to say where they found them from. Uh, it's always good to have dogs to find them because, uh, well, on occasion, dogs train themselves sometimes. And so uh, I've met a dog who has uh, shown up with truffles for its owner from their area around where they live. And um, that's how the owner found out that they had truffles. So you never know your look. Uh, just in the bottom right hand corner are the distinctive spores of tuberae stevum. It normally grows with uh, oak or hazel, but also with beech. Unfortunately, in recent times, Hymenocyphus fraxinius has been imported into Ireland. Um, it's definitely with us since in, for the last 10 years or so, um, and possibly longer. It was, um, it originated from Japan. It came into Poland, is the thinking, and it spread around Europe, killing ash trees uh, in Europe ever since. Um, it's moved very quickly. It's a severe epidemic now, and it also gangs up on ash trees with other species. I'm sure they don't think about it like this, but there is a cascade of species that are now attacking our Fraxinus. It's strange, but in Japan, Hymenocyphus fraxinius lives happily with the Manchurian ash that it's host on, it's it's hosting there, and um, it's very odd. No one quite understands why this species is so good at killing our ash trees. It's not really in the interest of the species to kill its host this quickly because it will run out of 
victims after a while. But uh, it's a severe problem that we have. Um, most of our native trees are ash in Ireland, particularly in any limestone areas. And so this is a huge threat to all of the associated species with ash um, in Ireland, um, of which there are hundreds of lichens alone. They may also exist on other tree types, but there are a lot of specialists on ash and um, all of the other wildlife that lives with and on and under ash. So fungi provide important roles in nature. Without fungi, we would be uh, drowning in our own rubbish and leaves and dead things. And uh, they're the great cyclers of nutrients on our planet, along with bacteria, of course. We have to give them a mention. So uh, soils would be very slow to break down as well because of, uh, if there was a lack of fungi. And a very special relationship are the fungi that are ectomycorrhizal with trees. But we also have um, arbuscular mycorrhizae with other plant species. Um, it's just, I suppose, a particular interest of mine is the association with trees. And this is a nice graphic by Rohit Sharma, and it shows uh, so much detail uh, packed into a nice sketch. But uh, Ectomycorrhizal fungi improve uptake in nutrients. They help the tolerance to stresses for the tree and mobilize um, different nutrients for the tree. If you look down at the base of the tree and the root systems, there's a whole range of elements um, that the fungi help the tree to access through um, breaking down of the soil and wrapping around the root systems of the tree in order to create an interface for this exchange. Um, other microbial communities, especially the bacteria, there are helper bacteria that also provide the uh, interaction with minerals in the soil and uh, carbon cycling is assisted to general productivity of plants is enhanced by interactions with fungi. That is the uh, positive fungi. So fungi today in Ireland, we know of, of over five and a half thousand species across all the groups of fungi. That picture is rapidly changing because of access to next generation sequencing and genomic work. So we only have one protected species for all of these, and that is a particular issue. Um, up in the top corner, what used to be called Fulgensia fulgens is now Gaia Lelicia fulgens, and it's found in the back dunes of Ballyteague Burrows in County Wexford. Um, it's the only species that is um, on our list so far, so that's a bit sad. Um, it's quite a minor species. It's very rare in Ireland and it's much more common on gypsum deposits in Spain would be its normal territory, but other places in Europe too. There's quite a lot of research on agaricus spice boris in Ireland because it is the main exported agaric for food, for human food. And there's quite a bit of work on fungal pathogens of humans going on in Ireland these days. The research on pathogenic fungi that affect arable crops and other foods that we have is also going strong. And um, the work to, to kill these fungi so that they don't uh, kill off enough of our food to cause major issues for us, but also that they don't contaminate our food with uh, aflatoxins uh, that will uh, cause toxic effects, obviously, to humans who eat them. In that group then is ergot, uh, claviceps purpurea, which we think is making a bit of a comeback in Ireland. Then there are lots of applications of fungi clearly in pharmaceuticals, but also in biocontrols and to control the rotting of wood timbers in housing. And there are lots of uh, other 
studies going on researching chemicals created by fungi. There are thousands of secondary metabolites that we don't understand a use for them in our own um, medicines and other, other applications. Uh, there used to be this thinking that the Irish people were mycophobic, and I really don't think so. I think there have been disruptions in the past with our relationship, particularly with woodland fungi and deforestation, the application of penal laws um, inhibiting people from accessing woodlands and wood and being able to continue the learning and knowledge so that there was a break in our knowledge, I think, of woodland management and then of woodland fungi in particular. This loss of knowledge and how to encourage choice species has been widespread, not just in Ireland. People are rediscovering methodologies to encourage, say, truffle growing, uh, but very, very few of the fungi have been domesticated for human use. Uh, I suppose when you have ignorance in the equation, it leads to fear and uh, lack of respect for fungi. Um, but a lot of people, when you meet them on field trips, they talk about their great experience of agaricus bisporus um, and other agarics field mushrooms that they've gathered as children and cooked and ate. Um, so song and story and recipe uh, creates a little haven for the memory of these field mushrooms. Uh, this is a picture in the right hand corner of uh, from the Book of Kells of what we think might be a truffle hound, although it could be a, an old potato. I don't know. But um, there are certain connections between Irish myths and fungi. And definitely the, the wee people, the little people, or um, the, the she, the fairies. Uh, but when you go abroad and you talk to people across the world about uh, fungi and you tell them you're from Ireland, the first thing they tell you in Japan is, ah, the Irish famine, Phytophthora infestans. And you're going, God, and most people in Ireland don't know Phytophthora infestans is potato blight or that it's a fungus and that it led to such a demise of Irish people. Um, but it is one in the textbooks, I suppose, internationally. Um, Traditional uses for fungi, there are plenty of them. Uh, some people still using them. Brewing them, obviously, I mentioned before, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. I don't think we need a picture of beer. <laughs> so that, uh, but cheese, yogurt making also relies on fungi. And of course, the growth in psychotropic recreation and their search for uh, psychiatric medicines from fungi. A lot of our medicines, obviously, are fungal based and there's new exciting areas of packaging and bioremediation using fungi too. So Irish names for fungi, a lot of us know about Foss Aenea to grow in one night, but then there's lots of other names that we've been looking into. And uh, there's a wonderful book from the turn of the century by Cameron, who looked into some of the names and what they mean. So. Uh, I really find quite interesting the whole use of crottle for dyeing in wool, um, but there are other ones, and kosh puka, the ghost cheese, which may apply to the puffballs, and uh, we're still working out, but there's definitely um, use of uh, certain names, bulg, bulgon, uh, bulg buchel, which, which point to the kind of uh, merriment area of Irish history and the use of um, more body names for uh, fungi in the past. So it's an interesting area of research to look up the old names. And some Irish mycologists have been very famous in the past, not that we celebrate them very much, but uh, Patrick Bowne developed the Cladonia concept in correspondence with Linnaeus. John Templeton was a fantastic naturalist based in Belfast, and he inspired Thomas Taylor, who described many species of fungi, particularly the lichens to science, some of them still existing in their original names as he described them. Uh, there was Admiral Theobald Jones, who made lots of collections of fungi, uh, particularly the lichens again, and Matilda Cullen Knowles. 
Um, Muscat and Malone got together and did a series of papers on what was known about Irish fungi uh, in a major checklist series in, from the 1970s. And fungi and their relationships with other species. So I'm just conscious with the Irish Wildlife Trust that we'll be thinking about other species besides humans um, and trees and plants, obviously, we've dealt with. But squirrels use uh, fungi for food. I've seen them collecting russulas. Uh, termites grow this massive fungus, Termatomyces titanicus, and it uh, the termites use the breakdown products to feed their larvae. Uh, and we, medicines, antibiotics, obviously, um, lots of fungi lay eggs in, lots of insects even lay eggs in fungi. And it would be really lovely to team up with somebody who would be interested in growing on some of these species to see what they actually are. But uh, that's for another day, perhaps. Um, a nesting material for birds. It's lovely that some lichens in particular are selected and they may be providing antibiotic uh, benefits for the birds in the nesting material. Then uh, a whole cascade of species attack hosts, as I said, for the trees and poisons uh, are not something beneficial, but they're definitely in the mix of what fungi do with other species. So fungal threats to us include that of poison and pathogens. Uh, pathogens of our food like ergot and other species. Uh, pathogens of wild trees and plants. We're looking at an ermalaria here attacking a uh, tree. And then um, obviously soil security is a problem when the trees are lost. And that also leads to knock on effects of habitat integrity loss as well. So um, Pathogens of other creatures, obviously, even insects piled up in a windowsill can be taken over by fungi in quite horrific ways. But we also provide threats to fungi with habitat destruction and loss. I suppose we're able to use heavy plant material now to get rid of habitats overnight or in very short time compared to manu hard manual labor in the past. Um, with climate change, we're dehydrating our landscapes uh, when they're being deforested and pollution of air and water and air water together, especially with nitrogen enrichment, is causing such havoc because fungi depend on a nitrogen carbon ratio balance and we are disturbing that balance by the use of artificial fertilizers and slurry. So ammonia is the big issue. Ammonia, ammonium, uh, dry and wet fallout from them. In the bottom right again here, you see the effects of ammonia on this birch tree. And there's nearly a total replacement of lichens with algal growth. So we have biocides compaction, exploitation of fungi in picking and overpicking. And um, when our actions favor smaller numbers of species, so policy, um, ignorance leading to lack of care. So we've plant pathogens coming in, a slew of them. This is uh, the after effects of sudden oak death on an oak tree. And we've done some serious amount of work. I suppose I've done most of my work with Howard Fox. Uh, set up baselines for heavy elements within fungi and lichens. Uh, we've looked at stone, stone surfaces, rock surfaces, and uh, then major lichen surveys here and internationally. But uh, I suppose the growing of wild shiitake, growing of wild edible fungi and, and surveying for them, but also looking at uh, shiitake growing and oyster mushrooms on trees and logs um, has been interesting too. Uh, very interesting has been the work on air quality and the impact on epiphytes. Uh, from a 7,000 twig study, we found two that were recruiting Osnia. Now, partly that's because the um, this is the old man's beard lichen, and it's quite sensitive, very sensitive really, to air quality deterioration. Um, this Osnia was only recruiting on two of 7,000 
and these um, twigs were coming from Donegal to County Louth. So they were in headwater streams. It's such a, a scary thing to think that they are not recruiting as they should. Uh, we look at ancient woodland indicators and we're looking um, at different sites around the island for their biodiversity, um, whether that's a bioblitz or a mycoblitz incorporating um, the fungi into the, the specific study. Um, we've been developing ancient woodland indicator species of lichens and some fungi as well uh, across Ireland so that we can tell a little bit more about longevity of woodland and that, yeah. Uh, we work with the Poisons Information Centre and there's a fantastic organisation who keep people safe. Uh, if anybody has a problem with a mushroom poisoning event, absolutely contact them. They pass on information to panel of mycologists. Uh, things we could do better for fungi, I suppose this is the crux of the whole thing. Uh, conservation is pretty much non-existent in Ireland and very embarrassing. Uh, ongoing issues with this for years when it comes to fungal conservation in Ireland. Uh, if we could improve forest practices, so taproot, intact taproots are very important. The control of ivy, I know that's not popular with everybody. Um, I don't know how we control our malaria and melia honey fungus spread around the country. It seems to be spreading a lot more. Um, land use continuity we can do something about that for sure and hedro uh, intact hedro uh, continuity uh, compaction of soils is a huge issue and one that's been coming more to the fore something we can easily do something about uh, improving our air and water quality much more challenging perhaps with current agricultural practices that's not to blame farmers it's what they're being told to do education about the importance of fungi for all habitats and then um, securing access to voucher material to study, places to study and um, funding, I suppose, is always what people want for research into the species themselves and their habitats. I suppose keeping things out of Ireland is a huge issue too, but very difficult with open trade agreements that we have. And the most thing, most important thing even to have is fun with fungi. So here's a picture of a cookout with fungi that people are trying new species slathered in butter. And on the right hand side, um, labeled materials so that people can have a look at these exhibitions of fungi and learn some of the species and what's safe and what's not. Uh, so we have some events coming up. Um, there's a giant, giant perf ball search, which is getting started this year. It was quite late um, because it was so dry, but it's going to be a bumper year for fungi. So if you're out and about and you happen to see a giant, giant puff ball, do measure it around and weigh it if you can and let us know. Um, but also there'll be some events coming up like in the Organic Centre this weekend. Um, we're looking at some workshops on fungal identification and uh, exhibitions of fungi, hopefully, to uh, the usual suspects when it comes to mushroom hunts and walks and that. Um, hopefully we do something for Culture Night and the Society of Irish Plant Pathologists just to give a plug for the November meeting. So that's it. Thank you. Sorry if I went on a bit long, um, but I'm delighted and thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, that was really wonderful, uh, Maria. You covered a huge uh, amount of ground in in a very short space of time, and I know we could all listen to uh, uh, a talk much longer on this on this topic. Um, so it's great to see we've already got a, a good few questions coming in. But if you if you do have a question for Maria, uh, we've got about ten or fifteen minutes or so. Uh, please put it into the Q and A button uh, uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, Maria, first of all, I'm, I mean, I, I, I uh, like many people, I suppose, uh, the, I've been reading a lot about uh, mushrooms and fungi and mycorrhizal networks and so on in the context of the work that Suzanne Simard has done in uh, Canada. It's quite extraordinary uh, revelations about, you know, the, the wood wide web and trees communicating with each other. And we're also hearing 
you know, quite staggering uh, things about, you know, the amount of carbon that these mycelia hold in the soil and all the rest of it. And I was wondering, could you comment on the, about that in an Irish context? And maybe the other side of my question is about the kinds of things that impact on mycelia networks. Uh, and I'm thinking in particular, two areas that I have heard anecdotally uh, impact uh, these, but I haven't found any particular research on it. And one is clear felling of uh, you know, uh, trees that we do quite a lot in Ireland. And the other is uh, artificial nitrogen that we put quite a lot of on our grasslands. Um, yeah, so uh, can you comment on that? Okay, surely. Um, so the world wide, the world would wide web have both. It's, it's super stuff. I mean, people have been looking at uh, the, the enzymatic uh, relationships and it's not something I've been doing, but it's wonderful that uh, these signaling pathways have been better understood. And uh, I know the threats that come, you see the reaction uh, of fungi, lichens in particular. I, I know in the past people have written into shows and said, uh, should I scrape off the lichens of this apple tree? They're, they're killing my apple tree. And what's happening is that the uh, lichens are aware from the signals from the tree, the clear signals of defoliation probably and canker uh, spill and chemical changes that the tree is going to die and they're living on this tree. So they're going to die too. And they go into a rapid phase of reproduction in order to move on to something else with the spores. Um, so they look like they're doing really well when the tree is suffering, but they're actually signaled that the tree is in trouble and they need to do something and move on. So I suppose underground, that's harder to see in the network of trees and, um, and wider nature. But those signals are very, very important. And um, we're only scratching the surface of understanding all of this, which is, is super now with um, underground mapping of mycelial connections and um, whether things are clonal, like you can tell that the biggest organism in the world is the Narmalaria uh, because uh, it's a clonal hectare, like several hectares covered in this. So it might not be good news for the trees it's dealing with, but we are learning far, far more very, very quickly about the fungal kingdom uh, in that way, especially. Um, I suppose impacts, uh, if I've dealt with the first half properly, and it might not have impacts, uh, I mentioned nitrogen, I suppose, oh, carbon sinking. Uh, definitely in natural systems, carbon is locked down by fungi, but they do breathe out carbon dioxide. So it's a much more complex thing. And I suppose having shorthand like red, red plus um, for carbon credits, the whole system based on carbon is almost a, a shorthand for biodiversity. And so we're getting better at taking more detail into account in big data sets. So it's, it's again, it's more complicated, but in a natural system, carbon is locked in better by well-functioning systems involving fungi. Um, on impacts, nitrogen increase, as I mentioned, is having a huge negative impact. And you can, you can tear mycelium by uh, physical breakage, but the chemical attack um, in our air and soil water that's contaminated is um, the big change, as well as adding slurry to the soil, practically drowning. A lot of fungi don't like getting their feet wet, and so overwatering them or including water in slurry spread material is, um, is a problem, a huge challenge. And we can wipe them out. We know that from field mushrooms, wax cap surveys where intact soil fungi communities are quite restricted. Um, I have a few maybe short answer questions here for you. Uh, <laughs> one is about dieback of alder, Kay is asking, and is that that's something that I had never heard of until quite recently. Is that in Ireland is, or how serious is that? Yes, um, alder is, is in trouble. I think all of our major, 
all of our native trees are in some kind of trouble. Now, some of the impacts are from bacteria and some are from cascades of fungi, but there is an alder dieback. Um, uh, Rowan are in trouble, but that is a, a viral infection. Um, mainly the focus has been on sudden oak death and the various phytophthoras that have been affecting things uh, as well as the ash. But uh, I don't think there's a major... Um, a tree type in Ireland that isn't under some kind of attack um, in a fairly extensive way now. Mm. Um, Aoife wants to know, can you give the name of the book with the Irish names for fungi? Oh, um, Cameron. I'm not sure of the year, uh, but it's in, I looked it up in the Royal Irish Academy years ago, and it's really quite fascinating. There's only a couple of pages with the names now. They come from Scotland and Wales as well as Ireland. It's kind of a synthesis, and it's a small book. But I can definitely look it up and pass it on to you if you want to. If we could, we could put it onto the end notes uh, when we yes. post this uh, to, to YouTube. That would be a nice one. Uh, Jessica is wondering, she's a final year botany student and interested in studying mycology in the future. Um, what advice would you have for her uh, studying <laughs> mycology? And maybe as a broader question, I mean, what, you know, what kind of courses do you do or where do you go if you want to study mycology? It's, it's really difficult in Ireland. Um, I would say go abroad if you're not having a reason to stay. There's a lot to do here. But I think if you're interested in your own career more than Ireland, go somewhere with a good supervisor, uh, someone with a very good track record. Um, and, and try and get with the technology because very few people know the uh, traditional methods that, that well now, but uh, everything is done in the lab pretty much, which is a pity because we still need names to, to put on a lot of the things we study. And also we need to be sure that what we're studying is actually the thing we think it is. Um, and often that, that needs to be weeded out when it comes to blast sequencing um, and GenBank. Uh, what's there already but it is uh, that would be my advice uh, we're seeing more attention uh given to soil health uh in recent years and uh even you know bodies like chagas the department of agriculture doing studies on soil health i mean do you think this is uh, uh, do you think my, uh, fungi are on their radar when they're thinking about this is there opportunities there to, <laughs> to kind of mainstream the study of these things I've been banging that drum for about 20 <laughs> years, so I hope so. But uh, it's, uh, yes, I think with the greater study potential with genetics, then there's more awareness and there's more capacity to do things. I think the biggest problem with the uh, with Ash dieback and a lot of threats is that people have said to me, like, why know about them when we can't do anything about it? So something like soil compaction, uh, there was a long-term study in uh, Switzerland with Simone Egli uh, over 25 years, and they found that compaction of the soil was the biggest threat. But I think here we have local threats like ivy on ground cover um, in suburban feeling woods and forestry and that. But I think continuous cover is vital. That is the you know along with pollution which something that's a chemical threat in the air is going to kill things very very efficiently whereas a physical threat you can knock things back but it can be hard to kill fungi right out unless you attack them with a poison that mm. is a poison to them yeah uh, quite a few people asking for, you know, good sources, you know, books and things like that, I suppose, for identifying fungi. So we might put those also into, and certainly if you're sending us the name of that Irish book, you might send us a few uh, other books uh, that we can include. This is Roger. Roger Phillips, a pretty Roger nasty Phillips, version. Yes. Roger died this year, sadly. Yes. But, um, this is the second edition book. It would keep you going for five to ten years. <laughs> and also, it's hard to get now, but there is... Um, the, the, it's online actually uh you can download it now uh forest fungi of ireland um that was uh 2008 um by paul dowding and louis smith uh and yeah we come on a field trip or something as well we can usually bring a whole 
box of books and can go through some of the the good um, international books as well that can be supportive. Yeah, there's Roger a lovely Phillips one is particularly good because it has such good photographs in it and so many photographs yes. and uh, and it's a great way of learning that way. And um, also, um, Marie, a lot of people wondering where to find particular types of mushrooms. I think your mention of truffles uh, has piqued some attention. <laughs> um, but is there, um, I mean, is that, uh, are, we, are we recording where mushrooms are and fungi are in Ireland? Is that information kind of accessible or? Yes. Um... It's quite fragmented, though, and I think the difficulty I've, I've had with NBDC, the National Biodiversity Data Centre, is that if I, if anyone gives them data on exactly where chanterelles grow or seps grow, there aren't that many sites in Ireland, to be honest, and they're not in great condition always. So it's... Um, I have had calls in the past where people have said, I want to pick seps and I'm in this county, where should I go? Or uh, about truffles especially too, because they're expensive. Um, and you, this is a problem. Um, how do we record them? I know in, in plants as well, if you're recording orchids, it can be difficult to say where something is. There, there are thefts, I know even in fossils and mineral collection, you know, there are people out there with, rock saws so when it comes to fungi people aren't um there there is a lot more pressure on the resource than was there say for 20 years ago too there's more awareness more people are out and there's definitely chefs have reported back that they're there they can be under intense pressure to find what was they were tripping over uh 20 years ago that's not a euphemism no they were really literally tripping over. so uh yeah that that is the psychotropic fungi too i mean it's technically illegal to possess any psychotropic uh, compounds so uh that, that's a whole other day's work but i think if we illegal. tell people exactly yeah if we give one kilometer square data that might put the the species under pressure so it is a yeah. A bit of a tough one when it comes to that. I think people just, they learn their area. I always advise, get to know somewhere you're going to care about and look after it. And then try and learn some techniques as to how you can minimize the damage and maximize uh, any benefits you can bring to the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, we, we, we wrap up, uh, maybe, Maria, just one other question. And Nancy is asking, you know, what other species of fungi would you like to see gain legal protection? And maybe I, I will broaden that out a little bit. I mean, what are the, you know, what are the, the big kind of policy ideas, whether that's, you know, identifying lists of rare species or protected areas? What are those things that you'd like to see for fungi in Ireland? Oh, I have a long, long list of species and they're real species. It's not like they, they've been recorded once. Um, it's hard to draw the line because if you want to be honest about it, there's a lot of species under pressure. Um, but uh, then the powers that be don't want to have a huge list to have to deal with and learn about and characterize. So even for red lists, um, you have to do quite a bit of study to show how vulnerable a group is, as, as you do with any other uh, species that you're looking to protect. So a huge amount of work there. But also, um, yeah, there there hasn't been that. I think the, the, the fear factor is there. If we have that many more species um, on annex lists, then uh, people would have to know about them and be paid to go look for them. And, and they're... they're yeah, they're just other priorities, really. Um, they're not seen to be that important for the numbers of species that are there. So that's a hard one. But at the end of the day, um, yeah, we're not really holding up our side. And the, the sad part is you can do an awful lot of work on red listing. And it's really just Annex 1, Annex 2. Uh, that might not be a popular thing to say, but, you know, you, in some projects you find you could have breeding leprechauns and it wouldn't really matter so mm -hmm. i think we have to be a lot more honest and a lot better at looking after uh our species i guess lichens are and other like non-lichenized fungi come under um 
It's a bit like geological heritage areas. Um, there were habitats in the past. And in a way, if you look after the habitats, you look after the fungi. But I, I have found that, the say, with ammonia, the one microgram per meter cubed of ammonia uh, concentration is the level for fungal and uh, for bryophyte protection, as opposed to three micrograms per meter cube for human health. And that has been very hard to instill or to, to um, put into action here. So, you know, there are proxies for looking after a whole range of species that very few people know, um, but we haven't really done that. Yeah, so true. Uh, well, um, you, you've brought so much uh, to the topic through your own uh, study, and uh, we're very grateful for that. And we hope you keep at it. You know, we all hope that we will turn a corner someday and we'd appreciate, you know, the wonders of all these different things and we'll invest in them and actually protect them. Um, so we we, we, uh, we continue to hope that will happen and not despair completely. Um, so Maria, thank you so much. That was really a wonderful talk and a wonderful insight uh, uh, into this topic. Uh, and thank you everybody at home for tuning in. It was a fantastic turnout. Um, mm -hmm. the, the webinar will go on to our YouTube channel where you can watch it back. And some people are asking about the details of the events, if we you, you'll be able to you'll be able to look at that uh, slide and, and get the details of the events um, and once again don't forget to go on to uh, that that youtube channel and look at all our other um webinars and don't forget to go on to the irish wildlife trust webinar uh, website and, and support the work uh, we do in trying to bring awareness of all these uh, different environmental issues and uh, and the wonderful people out there like maria who are who are working on them day in and day out um and i think that's everything please do join us we have another very exciting webinar actually planned for the beginning of uh, october already so uh, so do watch out our social media channels for that one so once again thank you very much maria and good night and thank you to everybody at home bye bye thank you bye